Good morning. This morning, as we gather together for the last time, I would like to begin by thanking you for your great hospitality. It's been a real joy for me to be with my Franciscan sisters. I think Francis and Claire had a keen insight into building religious life, calling both men and women to work together to proclaim together, to call people to the communion of saints together. We really do complement one another. The men need you and you need the men. <laughs> I can truly speak from the men's point of view, we need you. <laughs> I would like to uh, speak this morning about the, uh, the importance of prayer uh, give a couple of um, examples and uh, uh, aids to prayer. Because in our efforts to be instruments of peace, I think that we have to be in communion with God at all times. Otherwise, we can become very easily discouraged because our efforts for peace often go unheeded. We work in the various ministries that we're involved in and nothing seems to change. A little bit changes, then it goes backwards. So if we're not well rooted in communion of life with God, I think we will give up very quickly. In uh, Luke's Gospel in chapter 10, where we looked at the example of Martha and Mary, the end of chapter 10, the Lord continues with prayer. And in chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, he talks about how to pray. Now it happened that he was in a certain place praying. Again, there's that indication that this was habitual. Just as in the time when he walked away to pray, here he was in a place praying. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, this is what to say. Father, may your name be held holy, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive each one who is in debt to us, and do not put us to the test. It's a much simpler form of the prayer than in Matthew's Gospel. Verse 5, he also said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him in the middle of the night to say, My friend, lend me three loaves, because a friend of mine on his travels has just arrived at my house, and I have nothing to offer him. And the man answers from inside the house, Do not bother me. The door is bolted now, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up to give it to you. I tell you, if the man does not get up and give it to him for friendship's sake, persistence will make him get up and give his friend all he wants. So keep at it. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Those three are very easy to remember. They spell ask. Ask, seek, and knock, A-S-K. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, everyone who knocks will have the door opened. What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, would hand him a snake? Or if he asked for an egg, hand him a scorpion? 
If you then, evil as you are, know how to give your children what is good, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? My first morning here at breakfast, there was bacon, but there were no eggs. So I asked one of the uh, cooks, I said, are you going to have eggs here this morning? She says, tomorrow. <laughs> so I learned my lesson this morning when we had sausage. I didn't ask, are there is there going to be an egg out here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, next day, big brunch. <laughs> so Luke tells us about prayer. And the example is hammered away. Keep at it. Persevere. Persevere. In John's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, we see Jesus at prayer, perhaps more than in the other Gospels. Jesus prays a lot out loud in John, but we see him at prayer often in Luke's Gospel. Matthew's version of Jesus at prayer in the garden is something that I often reflect on, and not just in Lent. It's in Matthew 26, verse 36. <clears throat> and those of you who've been to Jerusalem, you know that you come out the east side of the holy city, the old city, and there's a valley down there, the Kedron Valley. You walk right through it and right into the Garden of Olives, Gethsemane. And the guide pointed out several trees that probably were there in the time of Jesus, because evidently olives live a long time. I didn't know that. So as we were reading scripture and as some of the people started moving around on our pilgrimage, I went over to one of the old trees and I just sat there wondering, were you here? <laughs> were you here? What was it like? So Jesus came with them to a plot of land called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, stay here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him. I have a, not a devotion to, but an interest in Andrew, Peter's brother. He seemed to be left out of this little trinity of Peter, James, and John. Wonder how he felt. Remember, it was Andrew who brought Peter, Peter into the, the group. But it was always Peter, James, and John here, and Mount Tabor, the healing of the daughter of Jairus. No Andrew. And he began to feel sadness and anguish. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here and stay awake with me. That's the command he gave them. Wait and stay awake. That was his instruction in prayer. Wait and stay awake. And going on a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. My father, he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. <clears throat> Nevertheless, let it be as you, not I would have it. Alcoholics Anonymous says, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Isn't that interesting? He came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you had not the strength to stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing enough, but human nature is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed. My father, he said, If this cup cannot pass by, but I must drink it, your will be done. And he came back again and found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy. 
leaving them there. He didn't even say anything this time. He went away again and prayed for the third time, repeating the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, You can sleep on now and have your rest. Look, the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is not far away. Three times the Lord prayed. Three times he came back. Wait and stay awake. That's all we have to do. Archbishop Quinn gave our province a retreat a number of years ago at uh, San Juan Bautista. And each night he would have a question and answer time. And uh, Brother Mario Vasquez, who's one of our great old working brothers. You know, the tourists would always come to our old missions. <clears throat> and uh, there was no difference in the dress of the priests, the brothers, and the student friars. So the story is told that one tourist asked one of the old German brothers, Brother, how can you tell the difference between the priests, the brothers, and the students? The old brother was one of these guys who's at home on a tractor, like Brother Mario. And he said, Well, the brothers work, the students study, then there are the fathers. <laughs> Brother Mario was one of those great old guys. You'd always see him, <coughs> excuse me, digging or watering or hoeing or riding the tractor around the Casa in Scottsdale. And he said to Archbishop Quinn, who spoke on prayer that day, he said, Archbishop, I've been in this outfit for a long time. Brother Mario was probably near 90 at the time. And he says, when I go to prayer, nothing happens. I don't have a thought. I don't have anything in my heart. And Quinn just kind of lit up, because Quinn is a real man of prayer. And he said, brother, when you are there, God is working on you. Whether you have a thought or a feeling, you are in prayer. Isn't that beautiful? So wait and stay awake. At least wait. <laughs> the Second Vatican Council gave the church a new emphasis on liturgical prayer. My seminary formation did not prepare me that, for that at all. We didn't do liturgical prayer in San Diego in college. We had a prayer book with seminary prayers passed down from generation to generation. And they took a long time each day, but we said them. We also were taught the Ignatian method of meditation to picture a scene from scripture really get into that scene, to ask a grace from the meditation, and then to reflect upon the scene with three points, never two or one, always three, A, B, and C, or one, two, and three, and then to have a colloquy with God. Bishop Buddy, the founding bishop of San Diego Diocese, in order to make sure that we became men of prayer, had us write down our meditations. And he would collect them each quarter and read them. And at the end of each one's notebook, he would put in Latin, Vidi, I have seen, and then he would sign CFB, Charles Francis Buddy. Came from these parts. He was from the Diocese of St. Joseph, Missouri, Kansas City, St. Joseph. He was the rector of the cathedral. So that's what we did. Each night I would write down my meditation for the next morning. But I never heard of the breviary as prayer. Remember, it was still in Latin. Bishop Buddy said to us once in a conference, say the whole thing before 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, that's what they did. Or at 11 o'clock at night. I asked the deacon Guillermo this morning at breakfast, do you say the breviary? 
And he very innocently, he's only been ordained three weeks, he said, yes, I have to, I've just been ordained. <laughs> I'm going to ask him in another year or two, see how he's doing. <laughs> the breviary was not prayer, it was something in an alien language. And we got through it to get to the real prayer, the meditation, the Ignatian method. It is only, frankly, with great difficulty that I have, over the years since I was in Rome, I've studied the Psalms, prayed about them, studied the fathers of the church, looked at the original sources of the documents that are often in the second reading of Matins, of the Office of Readings, that I now, in not just in recent years, but in recent years, relatively speaking, that I have come to appreciate it and really love it. I love the Liturgy of the Hours. And I pray it as the introduction suggests throughout the day, to sanctify the day. And I think that for me that's a really great idea. It's right in the introduction, sanctification of the day. It makes a lot of sense to me just to stop at definite periods during the day and recite whatever hour is there. Bishop Robert Brahm, who was bishop in Duluth before coming to San Diego and a, a priest of the Winona Diocese, he's a good friend of mine. He was a year ahead of me in Rome, so he just retired this year. He was our student choir master. He's a marvelous liturgist, good theologian, and a fine bishop, I think. He told me at his last meeting of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, because he won't go anymore now that he's retired, he got up and gave a speech begging them not to translate the breviary the way they had the New Roman Missal. He says every priest that he has met, and all kinds of them, you know, come to San Diego, and we have a hospitality center by the seminary where lots of priests stay. And whenever they are there, he's right next door. He comes over and he meets them. And every time this past year, he asked them, what do you think of the new Roman Missal? He said he didn't find one who liked it or regarded it as an improvement. The young guys all like it, but they don't know the difference. So he got up and told the bishops this at the last meeting. And he said, if you translate it, and present it to the priests, that will be the end of it. They won't use it. And he walked back to his place, and there was not one bit of applause. And he told me, he said, anybody can get up there and talk about anything, and they always applaud. It's called fear. Fear. As I was preparing for the retreat, I asked myself this question, how can I explain to the sisters what I do in prayer without sounding pedantic or boastful? And I thought, well, I'm just going to tell you what I do. <laughs> and uh, if it helps, fine. I hope it does. I ran across a, an article years ago in the America magazine written by Abbot Keating, do you know him, the Trappist? And it was on contemplative prayer. And the gist of the article was that contemplative prayer is not reserved for the mystics. And I said, what do you mean? That's the way it was always presented to me. For you people, me and the rest of us, you should be satisfied with the Ignatian method of meditation. But Abbot Keating said, no, every meditative period should end with contemplation for everybody. This was new to me, absolutely brand new. And isn't it wonderful every once in a while to get a new thought? <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't get that many of them, but when I do, I really, I just come to life. We looked upon people like Teresa of Avila and Francis and Claire and people like that as the great mystics who were lost in the contemplation of God. Well, that's mystical prayer. 
That's not contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer, according to Abbot Keating, is for everybody. And it's simply being in the presence of God. It's what Jesus said in the garden. Wait and stay awake. It's just that simple. I said, how can I learn this after all these years? Why hasn't somebody told me this before? Thank God I subscribed to America Magazine. So here's what he suggested as a four-part practice of prayer. And I've been following it ever since. First, you know these as well as I do. Lexio Divina, the divine reading. Read something. I use the Office of Readings for this. The three Psalms, a reading from scripture and a reading from a saint or the fathers of the church <clears throat> or a conciliar document. And he says, read until you get a thought. <laughs> that might be a long way into it, or it might be a short time. And then he said, stop. Just not a halt, but a, a gliding stop. And then he says, begin to meditate. Meditatio. Meditation, he says, is just thinking about something. So let's say we're using the story of Martha and Mary. It's only two or three uh, verses and at the end of it, start thinking. Why do you think Martha was so upset? How close was Jesus to them? It feels like he used to stop in there regularly. Where was Lazarus? It was unseemly for a rabbi to be in the presence of a woman alone. And just think about it. Don't pray words yet, just think about it. Can I digress for a second? A thought occurred to me about a rabbi. Now, if I've told you the story, somebody in the back, raise your hand. When I had our group in the Holy Land, we had 90 people from Huntington Beach, two busloads, way too many, because someone was always late. And it was really maddening. So we were lounging by the Sea of Galilee, and we had no churches to visit so everybody was in shorts and tank tops and stuff and a bus load of uh, orthodox jews sh showed up and uh, the girls were in long sleeves and a little veil on long dress and the boys with the curls and all that so one of the gals in our group came up to me father larry why do those boys have those curls on the side and i looked and there was the old rabbi getting off the bus was very hot and he had a big heavy black coat and a big black hat on. And I said, honey, why don't you go over and ask that man there because he knows about these things. So she goes charging over to him wearing shorts and a tank top. He took one look at her, turned around and went into the bus and shut the door. Now she knew immediately I'd set her up. So she was really pretty mad at me. But we gathered all 90 of us around and talked about Jesus and the woman at the well. How extraordinary that conversation was. Jesus alone with a woman. Well, how about this scene of Mary and Martha? The same thing. So just meditate. Think about it. Then Abbot Keating suggests prayer. Oratio is the third part. So the first is reading. Second is meditating. The third is prayer. And uh, he divides it into four types, and you can use any or none. And they spell ACTS, A-C-T-S. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. So whatever is foremost in your mind, just go with it. Don't be a slave to the structure, just go with it. And then he says, and this is the key point, as you kind of poop out, of prayer and you're tired and you've said all you can say you've thought all you can think rest in God and that's contemplative prayer and he tells all the things that we've learned from Eastern religions about posture and breathing but it seems so simple and at first I was going crazy on it because I got all hung up in the structure then I relaxed a little bit and now it comes automatically and I love it. It's a great way to pray. It's very simple. 
prayer is at the heart of our ministry. We become very dried up if we're not women and men of prayer. In number 281, Pope Francis in the Apostolic Exhortation, number 281, speaks of the, quote, missionary power of intercessory prayer. And I would just add to that, when all else fails, pray. <laughs> if you've been trying to do something, whatever it is, you, I think we have to be like St. Monica. She's my patroness. She prayed for Augustine all her life. And I love St. Monica. I graduated, this is a term we use, it's kind of silly, but I graduated from Guest House on the Feast of St. Monica, 1982. So there were five of us who were leaving after three months, and uh, they asked me to give the homily. So I went on and on about Monica. And Augustine tells us in his confessions that she had a little bit too much fondness for wine. And I thought, guys, she's our girl. She's our, she's our patroness. <laughs> so St. Monica, the missionary power of intercessory prayer. Remember the story of the little flower, how she wanted to be a missionary? Her uh, convent there sent missionaries to Vietnam. And she wanted to go, but she was too sick. And she couldn't go. And then she realized that her vocation was going to be a lady of prayer, a powerful woman of prayer. I think she was only 24, when something like that. All those women saints who die, like St. Elizabeth of Hungary and all of them, they make me sick. 24, and they were, you know, at 24 I was drinking somewhere. So as we conclude the retreat, I would just encourage you to recommit yourselves, as I will with you, to your life of prayer on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And I want to close with a prayer of uh, uh, Pope Francis. And this is at the conclusion of his exhortation. It's a prayer to Mary. And it's just so beautiful. It's like your prayer at the end of morning prayer. Mary, virgin and mother, you who moved by the Holy Spirit, welcome the word of life in the depths of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call, as pressing as ever, to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Filled with Christ's presence, you brought joy to John the Baptist, making him exult in the womb of his mother. Brimming over with joy, you sang of the great things done by God. Standing at the foot of the cross with unyielding faith, you received the joyful comfort of the resurrection and joined the disciples in awaiting the Spirit so that the evangelizing church might be born. Obtain for us now a new ardor born of the resurrection, that we may bring to all the gospel of life which triumphs over death. Give us a holy courage to seek new paths, that the gift of unfading beauty may reach every man and woman. Virgin of listening and contemplation, mother of love, bride of the eternal wedding feast, pray for the church, whose pure icon you are, that she may never be closed in on herself or lose her passion for establishing God's kingdom. Star of the new evangelization, help us to bear radiant witness to communion, service, ardent and generous faith, justice and love of the poor that the joy of the gospel may reach to the ends of the earth, illuminating even the fringes of our world. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones, pray for us, amen and alleluia. 
Isn't that beautiful? Well, that'll be our closing prayer. And thank you again. It's been so wonderful that you invited me to be with you. I, I will treasure all of you for the rest of my days. So God bless you. Okay.